Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. Our lecture today is sponsored by the Preservation Association of Lincoln. If you're interested in these programs, we ask you to join our membership. The membership is on, available online at preservelincoln.org. Our speaker today is Matt Hansen. Matt is a licensed architect and a native of Lincoln, Nebraska. He attended the College of Architecture at UNL, where he graduated with a master's degree in 2000. After graduation, he spent 10 years doing preservation architecture work for the firm of Bar Vermeer and Hacker Architects in Lincoln, and was heavily involved with the Capitol Masonry Restoration Project. After moving to Sioux Falls, South Dakota for two years, Matt and his wife Heather returned to Lincoln in the summer of 2010 where he took on the role of preservation architect at, with the state of Nebraska Office of the Capitol Commission, which is the agency that oversees the preservation and day-to-day -day maintenance of the Capitol and its site. His longtime interest in research into the history of the Lincoln Monument on the Capitol site have formed the foundation for this talk today, which is titled The Lincoln Monument at the Nebraska State Capitol. Please join me in welcoming Matt. Thanks, Eileen. Thanks, everybody that came out today and for everybody else that's watching at home. Um, as many of you know, September 2nd of this year, which is about six weeks away now, marks the 100th anniversary of the dedication of the Lincoln Monument. But it's been my experience that not too many people are really very well aware of just the significance of this piece of art, not only locally here in Lincoln or statewide, but on a national level. And so. My hope today is we can give you some information uh, just about this statue, this monument, and how it was created, um, the people involved, and I think it'll give us some appreciation of just what a gem we have here, um, and hopefully everybody will be interested in coming out and helping us uh, celebrate the second hundred years of this, the great monument coming up here. So I've got about 60 slides today. I'm going to try and keep this moving along as best I can so we can get through uh, with some time for some questions at the end. Um, there had actually been a series of efforts over the years to get a monument um, in the city of Lincoln to, um, in honor of the president that uh, the city is named after. And for a variety of reasons, those, um, those efforts weren't successful until just after the turn of the century. Uh, there was a, a bill that was passed in the legislature, the 31st legislature, on May 12th of 1908, which appropriated a sum of $20,000 for the erection of a statue to Abraham Lincoln on the grounds of the Capitol. And the stated purpose of this act was to provide funds to er erect a memorial to Abraham Lincoln on the State House grounds in Lincoln, Nebraska, during the centennial year of his birth, which was 1909. So this got started just a couple years prior to 1909, but ultimately the way things played out, they didn't get it, all the fundraising done in time for the centennial. And so three years later, they finally got around to finishing up the project. And this uh, up here on the screen right now is the letterhead from um, the Abraham Lincoln Centennial Memorial Association of Nebraska, which was the organization established um, by the state statute, they appointed a series of um, officers who were uh, state officials, and then they selected a committee. Um, they appointed a chairman of the committee to select other members who were art experts to actually select a sculptor for the monument. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, Addison Waite, who was the Nebraska Secretary of State, served as the corresponding secretary, and he organized the effort to solicit and raise funds for the monument. Here's a, an example of one of the solicitation letters that went out to different communities across Nebraska. The fundraising really was a statewide event. Um, they were looking for people in every city to help raise money. And this was one of the uh, bills that they put out, or the letters they put out, and this was 1908 in June when they were starting to raise some money. We've got an example of one of the subscription cards here that when you made a donation, um, 
you got this receipt and it says that a subscription of at least 50 cents will um, entitle the sus subscriber to a certificate of membership in the Abraham Lincoln Centennial Memorial Association. But unfortunately, we haven't found one of those uh, certificates to be able to show you. Another way that fundraising for the monument was, was done was they ran some ads in the newspapers and they offered some fundraising buttons for sale. They were priced at two for a quarter plus postage. Um, and this is an example of one of those buttons. They seem to be fairly scarce today, but they do show up from time to time, and we were able to find this one through an online auction. Um, but it's got the, the ACMA of N, which if you weren't familiar with what that meant, probably wouldn't make any connection between Nebraska and this button, but uh, it's kind of a fun thing. The, co the, the statewide committee um, appointed a local gentleman. He was an attorney and an art collector by the name of Frank Hall. Uh, many of you are familiar with the Hall Collection at Sheldon and the Nebraska Art Association, and Frank Hall was a, um, a key player in that and left um, money from his estate to purchase art for the university's art collection. In uh, July 16th of 1908, they offered the position of chairman of the committee to Frank Hall, and he responded in a letter to George Sheldon, who was the governor, and he wrote in part, and I'm going to read it to you because it's a little bit poetic. He said that the erection of a statue of Abraham Lincoln on our Capitol grounds is a magnificent undertaking and a great compliment to the manhood and womanhood of the state. This work should not be permitted to lag, but should be pushed forward vigorously to an early completion. It should receive the hearty cooperation of every loyal, patriotic, and liberty-loving man, woman, woman, and child in the state of Nebraska. It will make our hearts thrill with pride and love of country to stand before a great bronze statue of Abraham Lincoln. Let us voice this noble and heroic form, in this noble and heroic form, the belated debt of lasting gratitude felt by every American to this great man whose heart beat to the music of the battle drum and the flutter of the flag of human liberty. So he was waxing a little bit poetic, but he was an enthusiastic supporter of the effort and um, really was a key player in getting it accomplished. After a review process, Hall and his committee offered the commission to noted American sculptor Daniel Chester French on June 24th of 1909. Just a little bit of background about Daniel Chester French. He was born in 1850. Um, died in 1931, and he had a studio and summer home in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, which he called Chesterwood. It was also designed by um, noted architect Henry Bacon, and Bacon was the one that French would team up with on a variety of his sculptural commissions, um, most notably um, the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. Bacon was born in 1866 and died in 1924, and he and French worked together on numerous monuments over the years, and, and they were sort of a, a partnership team. French got started uh, with his first commissions in the 1870s, but um, was not a real household name until um, the 1893 Columbian Exposition in Chicago. And one of the centerpieces of that exhibition was this um, gigantic statue of the Republic, is what it was symbolizing. Um, French did the sculpture and Bacon did the pedestal on which it stands. And the sculpture um, itself was 65 feet high. It was made out of plaster and jute fiber. It was a material called staff, which was intended to be sort of a temporary material. And then it was covered with gold leaf. And this was a focal point of the exhibition and um, heavily remarked on by everybody that visited the fair. Just a few other examples of French's work around the country. Um, one of his earliest commissions was the Minuteman at Concord, New Hampshire, which a lot of people are familiar with. Um, he did other statues, including John Harvard, which sits in Harvard Square in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, several different prominent um, 
memorials or funerary markers, including one for Marshall Field in Chicago. Um, and then, of course, most notably, and probably what French is most recognized for is his work on the seated Lincoln that he did with um, Henry Bacon at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. Here's an example, a photograph of those two together um, working on the completed uh, Lincoln Memorial. And this was in, completed in 1922, just two years prior to Bacon's death. But to get back to Nebraska and our statue here, um, once he had the commission, French started working on a series of clay statues for the um, studies for the statue. And he eventually settled on a standing pose of Lincoln with his head bowed slightly and his hands clasped in front of him. There was a really interesting anecdote in a book that French's daughter Margaret wrote about him. It was a biography. And just to read a little snippet here, she said, the bronze figure of the president with his hands clasped in front of him looked as Dan, Dan hoped he would, alone, lost in thought, working out the destiny of a nation broken by war. The sad, far-seeing eyes were deep, sad, and tired. He stood on a low pedestal. Behind him, on a granite tablet, the lines of the Gettysburg Address. The evening after the unveiling, at the inevitable dinner in Dan's honor, a pretty woman sat next to him. Mr. French, she began. I was on the committee and was especially interested because as a young girl, my mother had heard Lincoln speak, not once, but numerous times. She often told me that Lincoln had a habit when he was gonna speak of coming to the edge of the platform and standing there for several minutes, his head bowed, his hands clasped in front of him. You can imagine my surprise when I saw your model to find that you had chosen the identical pose that my mother so often described. Did you ever hear Lincoln speak? How did you know that he stood like that? I didn't know, acknowledged Dan quietly, but I always mistrusted that Lincoln might have stood that way, revealing the crushing weight of the war still to be won. So with his um, design for the statue in place, um, Henry Bacon worked with French on coming up with a, an architectural setting on which to place the statue. And they came up with this design of kind of a low, low plaza that's approached by steps um, with a large tablet of granite behind the statue on which were inscribed the words of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And the granite for this monument was quarried from uh, near Quincy, Massachusetts. And I just did some quick calculations on um, what we call the tablet, which is the portion with the Gettysburg Address on it right behind the statue, uh, and just figuring out how much that thing weighs. If you take it and convert it into cubic feet, just the weight of the granite alone approaches 54.56 tons, which your average car weighs about two tons. So this thing weighs the equivalent of about 27 automobiles. Um, behind the statue on the granite, is inscribed the words of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And the, uh, the setting, the granite and everything was, was put up by the Kimball brothers who were a monument company here in Lincoln. Uh, Fred Kimball, who was one of the partners, was a very accomplished sculptor and a carver and he um, worked exclusively in marble and granite. Um, he also was responsible for the carving, not only of the letters on the monument, but the carving of the eagles on the other side. Unfortunately, this is the best picture I can show you of the groundbreaking. This was published in the newspaper um, December 22nd of 1911, which looks like it was a very cold day in Lincoln. We've got various um, state officials, including Addison Waite, who's got, um, he's holding a shovel right here. Um, and so various state dignitaries were in attendance. Unfortunately, they uh, workmen had actually gone out ahead of time and broken up the dirt so that they didn't have to struggle with trying to turn over the soil, which I think happens more than we probably think. Uh, the first carloads of granite arrived here in Lincoln on May 6 of 1912. Um, the statue was cast in New York and arrived on June 22nd and was erected into place on June 29th. And the entire monument was completed by August 24th. 
Um, here's an image that shows the monument and this is probably just prior to the dedication because they've got, um, there's a framework that you can see right here above the statue on top that's going to hold some flags for the unveiling. Um, a lot of people aren't aware that this monument actually predates the current capital. It sits, um, it sat on in front of uh, the west side of the second capitol building which stood until 1925 when it was raised for the, the current building. This is another view, again, just prior to the dedication. Give you a little bit better of the relationship between the monument and the building behind it. This was kind of an interesting piece, again, from an online auction that we came across. And this was a postcard of the second capital, but what's interesting is the inscription on here, which says, um, and I quote, a statue will be unveiled in front of this on September 2nd, and we could see it. I never saw one unveiled, did you? <laughs> and so this was postmarked August 23rd, so it was just before. Apparently, you know, like the, the previous slide, the statue was there. They didn't have it draped until just before the event, so some people were uh, were giving a little tip about what was to come here. The state of Nebraska um, extended an invitation to Abraham Lincoln's only surviving son, which was uh, Robert Todd Lincoln, and invited him to attend the unveiling of the monument. Um, Lincoln declined in a letter to Secretary of State Waite, and he stated, um, Dear Sir, I appreciate very much your letter of June 29th inviting me to attend the unveiling of the statue and memorial of my father, which is to take place on September 2nd. It has been a great pleasure to me to know that this memorial to my father is to be placed in your city named after him. And it would be a gratification if I were able to see the ceremony, but unfortunately, I am not in sufficiently good health to attend any of the meetings of this character and am compelled to refrain from accepting all public invitations. With many regrets, believe me, very sincerely yours, Robert Todd Lincoln. I just thought that was kind of a uh, very gracious way of declining the invitation. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to be here. But We did have a series of speakers um, for the dedication. There were actually two events. There was one on the north side of the old Capitol, and then they moved around to the west side to the statue and actually did the unveiling a little bit later. Um, this was September 2nd of 1912. It was Labor Day weekend. It was also State Fair um, week in Lincoln, so there were a large number of people in the city, and they estimated the crowd at about 10,000 people that attended the unveiling. So. Um, from the newspaper accounts, it was just packed. It was a on again, off again, rainy day, and a lot of the people had umbrellas. Um, but the sun and the rain, the the, sun, the rain stopped just in time for the unveiling, and the sun came out. Um, the platform program, which was held at the north entrance, had some. They started with some music. They had an invocation um, by a, the minister at St. Paul Methodist, and then they had. Um, an address by T.H. Pratt, who was standing in for the mayor of the city of Lincoln who couldn't attend. And then um, that was followed by more music, and then the keynote address by William Jennings Bryan, who was a very prominent Nebraskan and a national politician. Then they moved around to the monument exercises with more music by a fife and drum corps. And then the Gettysburg Address was read, and um, Secretary of State Addison Waite gave a talk about the history of the effort to create the monument, and then they unveiled the statue, and that was followed by an address by Frank Hall, who spoke about the monument as a work of art, and he also talked about the, sculpt the sculptor, Daniel Chester French. Apologize a little bit for the blurriness of this slide. This is one of the images um, that we have from the unveiling, and this was um, appears to be an image of William Jennings Bryan arriving um, in a horse-drawn carriage to speak. And then we've got a series of shots that were taken. Um, there were a number of photographers on hand for the event. 
um, one of which was actually an African-American photographer um, by the name of John Johnson, and some of you are familiar with, with his work. He was um, took a number of photographs of Lincoln, primarily in the African-American community, but he was on hand for this event, and we believe that um, these images um, were taken by him because they were found in the slide collections with the rest of his work. So this image shows the crowd gathered in front of the monument. You've got the the flags draping it, and this the statue of Lincoln is actually shrouded in a white cloth. It's kind of visible um, there behind the flags. What's kind of interesting here is as you're looking at details is there's a, a guy that climbed out on the parapet of the second capitol. <laughs> And he, he'll walk around and kind of lay down in front of this window here. <laughs> He's got, uh, <laughs> it's pretty brave or, or stupid, depending on your point of view. Um, but there were a lot of Civil War veterans in attendance, and they did ask how many of them had actually seen Lincoln during his lifetime, and there were a number of hands that went up. So we had people who had actually seen Lincoln firsthand present. Here's the next shot in the unveiling process, and these guys are, are tying loose the, the bindings at the foot of the statue so that the, dra or the flags can be pulled aside. And here they're just uh, pulling them apart. And here's, our, here's our daredevil reclining on the parapet there. There's another shot, um, the drapes, or the flags, just a little bit further open. And this is a, a different photography taking this image from a different viewpoint, but we can get kind of a feel for just how packed in the crowds were. There's a group of men standing here, which we're going to look at in more detail in just a second, and those were some of the dignitaries that were attending the event. There's another one of Mr. Johnson's images. Um, with the flags pulled all the way back, and we can see the, the statue in its full glory here. And then these final, final shots here of the crowd kind of milling around after everything was over and admiring Mr. French and Mr. Bacon's work. This is one of the more remarkable images. Um, a lot of these images are from the collection of the Nebraska State Historical Society, and we're very fortunate to have access to these. Um, this one shows a panoramic. It was taken with a panoramic camera, which actually ran on a bit of a track and would give you slightly more than 180 degree view of the proceedings. We're looking at the far left north on 14th Street and on the far right south on 14th Street. So it's a little bit of a skewed viewpoint, but you can see the, the whole crowd there. Zooming in a little bit through the um, benefits of digital scanning, we can kind of take a look at things in a little more detail. And just a little bit further, we can see the, the gentleman who unveiled the statue were both veterans of the Civil War, John Lett, L-E-T-T, -T, of Benedict, and Jonathan Edwards of Omaha. But I can't tell you which one is which, but they're on the left and the right-hand side pulling the flags back. And now this is kind of fun. Um, with a digital scan, even though this was a hard copy print, we can really start to pull out some detail. And I've a little white frame here um, on this group of, of standing folks and we can really zoom in and take a look at at these guys um, on the left we've got governor and um, mrs chester aldrich and then secretary of state addison Waite, frank hall who was the chairman of the committee to select the sculptor and then william jennings bryan with his um, he was often fond of wearing a cape, this is here. Then there's another guy that I can't see enough of him to tell you who it is, but then finally Daniel Chester French, and I believe his, his daughter Margaret was also in attendance with him, and I think that this is her standing next to her father. French actually didn't have a large role in the unveiling ceremony. He just, um, 
he was recognized at the end of Hall's talk and said that he stepped forward and bowed and then receded um, into the background. He, he wasn't a real uh, type of person that really liked a lot of recognition. He just, um, he just did his artwork and uh, here's an image of the statue just after the unveiling. And one thing to note in this photo is you can really see the, the paving on the plaza was actually a herringbone brick. And that was the original material spec by the architect and was installed. That later got changed when the third capital was built and they replaced it with Colorado red sandstone flagging. <laughs> and that material had actually formed the sidewalks of the old second capital. Here's another shot of the monument just after completion. Um, you can see the, the two large ornamental bronze light fixtures that flank either end of the plaza. Um, they've got melt glass globes up on top. And the plaza, when it was originally built, was, was a two-tiered plaza um, with a, a large space up here. And then you come down three risers, there was a second. Uh, plaza area and then three more risers down to the sidewalk and that all got revamped um, when the third capital was built and they changed some of the grades on the site they had to make some changes so that today you see just one continuous flight of steps down instead of having these two tiers of the plaza. Um, people were, were quick to capitalize on the Lincoln Monument as an icon um, including Addison Waite when he was running for re-election as Secretary of State. He was promoting himself as the author and promoter of the Lincoln Monument e Enterprise erected on the State House grounds in Lincoln, unveiled and dedicated to the State Labor Day, September 2nd, 1912. And this was postmarked October 31st, so it was a little over a month after the unveiling. He issued this postcard to help campaign. Here's a view looking um, east on from J Street towards the second capitol. Gives you a little bit of context of what the monument and its setting were like um, at the time it was first put up. The grounds on the second building were much more heavily landscaped. There were quite a few more trees than we have um, with the scheme for the third building. And the monument quickly became a site where groups would gather to have their picture taken or to have events. Um, and we've got a series of, of different images taken over the years of different events. Um, this one, I'm not entirely sure. I, I think we've determined that this was a House of Representatives gathering. A lot of the legislative members would go out and have their House or the Senate. Nebraska still had their bicameral at that time, have their picture taken in front of it. This is another group which I think might be a Senate. And this is a little bit later. Um, it's, it, the old building's still standing, but they've got construction for the third building starting. Um, and for those of you that might remember Senator Jerome Warner, his father was a longtime Senator, Charles Warner. He's here in the front row, which makes me think this might be uh, a group of senators here. When it came time to replace the second capital, um, the architectural program called for the Lincoln statue to remain in its location and be incorporated into the design for the new building. Um, and so here we've got workers starting to lay the rail line, which brought materials to and from the building during construction. And just on the left here, we can see the Lincoln Monument in place. And just in case you're wondering, the, the reason why they had to put the, the rail line so far down below the grade was just the difference in the uh, grade for the second building was much higher than um, in some areas than what was um, done on the third building. And so they actually, in order to not make the train have to go up such a steep grade to get onto the site, they actually had to cut the rail down into the yard. Here we've got a detail from that same shot with the monument and of interest is, is this flagpole, which is directly behind the monument. It's not attached to it, but you can see it continues to go 
up to a termination up here, and we believe that this this flagpole was well over 100 feet tall. It was just substantial. It was there for a number of years. Here's another shot, a little closer to the monument of the track laying. And then this remarkable image is from the Boswick Frohart collection in Omaha that's now owned by the Durham Western Heritage Museum. And this is um, prior to the summer of 1925 because the second building is still standing. We've got components of the third capital completed and they're working on carving. Um, and then there's a bridge here that connected the north and south portions which were built around the old capital before it was torn out. Here's another shot a little later in construction. Um, the building proper has been completed and they're just starting to work on the site and the, the walks approaching it. And you can see the Lincoln Monument here. We'll zoom in just a little bit. A little bit fuzzy, but um, they're actually in the process of starting to construct the walks, which will modify and create some openings. They, In the old... Uh, the site for the second building there were some driveways that went up in kind of a horseshoe around the monument and then you walked up but in Goodhue's design he wanted people to exit the building come out around the statue and down the stairs so they actually had to to cut into the granite to make these walkways on either side here's another shot just a little further along in the process and we can see again here's the monument they're starting to lay out the walks and they've got the concrete cores poured and they're getting ready to put the limestone on them. But they've, the workmen have actually cut the openings here in the granite. And you can see the, the single flight of stairs now down to the sidewalk level. In doing that, they actually had to lower the elevation of the plaza. And if you go out and look at the monument today, you can see the line of where the plaza level originally was. And then it was dropped down to accommodate the new grade as you exited the building. Here's a postcard shot from the 1940s. So the statue's been in place for, oh, probably 30 years at this point in time. Um, one thing a lot of people ask is this staining that's visible, and you can see it today on, on the granite. Um, and that's actually a product of a, a very early um, petroleum-based caulking that was used between the sections of granite and the petroleum products out of the caulking leached into the granite. And those of you that have granite countertops know the difficulty in keeping oil products from migrating into the stone. It's virtually impossible to remove. So uh, unfortunately, that happened fairly early. But here we can get a better sense of just the outdoor room that was designed um, by landscape architect Ernst Herminghaus with these upright junipers surrounding the statue. You can also see some corrosion starting to develop on especially the head and the hands and the lapels of the Lincoln statue. We don't have a lot of records about the maintenance that went on, if there was any, with the statue early on. And this um, deterioration and corrosion on the bronze is going to continue to accelerate <coughs> here. And this is um, by the 1960s, when the time these postcards were issued, it was really getting bad. Um, we had, oops, excuse me, we had this uh, almost a whitish oxidation and corrosion happening, and it um, affected <coughs> the face of Lincoln. And there's these dark streaks under the eyes, and it's actually starting to degrade the bronze at this point in time. And so a decision was made that it was time to do some conservation work on the statue. In 1966, um, some cosmetic treatments were done. They actually didn't remove the corrosion products on the bronze, but they applied a statuary bronze patination um, to cover those and give it a better appearance. This was kind of the result of that 1966 work, but again, really didn't address the underlying issues. Um, by the late 70s, the corrosion was starting to reoccur. Um, the patina had worn off and it was starting to become more visible. And at that time, um, conservators from 
Washington University and St. Louis were brought in to assess the statue and they made a decision that it was time to take some pretty drastic measures to, to halt this corrosion. Um, the statue was actually blasted with glass beads to remove not only the um, applied patina but the corrosion that was happening underneath and get it back down to bare metal which is what you see here in this shot. And then after it was taken down to bare metal um, a chemical patination was applied to give it a statuary bronze finish and then it was covered with a lacquer and then that again was coated with a sacrificial layer of paste wax. Also in 1980 there was some work done to the stairs. At the time the third building was completed they ran out of funds towards the end of construction to do all the improvements that they wanted to and um, when they took these stairs down to a single tier the, the edges were just kind of left exposed and raw and um, so by 1980 the state decided to carry out Bacon's original or, original design for terminating um, the stair landings and so they got inspiration from what he designed and came up with these um, these granite uh, walls, retaining walls to kind of finish off uh, the stairs and give it a more completed look. And then most recently, this was um, last December, we reassessed the monument again just anticipating the upcoming um, centennial of its dedication. Um, the same conservator who did the work in 1979 came back and assessed. We had some areas where um, the wax coating and the patina had failed over the years. We were starting to get some um, green corrosion happening, especially on top of Lincoln's head and his hair and down on the um, portions of his coat. And so um, Jensen Conservation out of uh, Omaha, Nebraska came in and did s some very minor conservation work here. They actually removed the, uh, the sacrificial wax coating, which is what's going on in this image, and then removed the corrosion products and then applied um, the chemical patina again using heat in the areas where the patination had been affected um, and then covered that with the lacquer and reapplied a coating of paste wax. And so here's uh, Maida Jensen from Jensen Conservation applying the paste wax and then her husband um, Robert is actually in the process of buffing out the wax here. And I shot that just because I thought it looked kind of fun like Abraham Lincoln had just got done at the gym. <laughs> or maybe running the Lincoln Marathon. A couple of details here um, that were taken during the conservation work. We can see um, this is on the south side of the statue where French has inscribed his name with SC for sculptor and the year 1912. And on the opposite side, on the north side, there's a little notation that was cast by the John Williams uh, foundry in New York. And this is a couple shots of the completed um, work after the conservation. Um, tour supervisor Roxanne Smith here looking up at Abraham Lincoln. And then a finished product after the wax has been applied on the right. Something else that we're in the process of working on and we had hoped to have in place in time for the upcoming September 2nd event was some kind of a lighting scheme for the statue. Um, back in 1983, some tests were done with a what was actually an interior theater spotlight to illuminate the statue, and this was a picture taken at that time. And this was the effect that we're, we're trying to achieve. Unfortunately, we're running into some obstacles with today's technology and um, haven't been able to find just the right fixture. Um, we had hoped to have this in place in time for the the September 2nd event, but it may not happen, but we're still working on getting a, a lighting system set up on the Nebraska State Education Association building west across 14th Street to illuminate the statue at night. Um, today the statue continues to serve as um, an important uh, civic monument here in Lincoln. It's a, a rallying place where a lot of um, politicians um, and different causes will gather um, for 
for making their causes known. Um, I think that was sort of French's intent was to make this uh, a gathering place as evidenced by, you know, the plaza and the benches that he put there for people to, to come and contemplate and also, um, you know, just present, pr present their ideas. And something that's happened here recently, it started in 1997, was the Sons of the Union Veterans of the Civil War, which is a successor organization to the Grand Army of the Republic. Um, every year on Lincoln's birthday on February 12th, um, these guys have come and stood as an honor guard um, on flanking either side of the statue, um, just as a tribute to, to Lincoln. And that's something that continues to this day. So as I mentioned already, we're planning a 100th anniversary celebration here coming up on September 2nd. Um, we'd love to have everybody join us for that. It's going to be a fun time. We'll have um, some speakers. Uh, conservator Maida Jensen is going to speak about Daniel Chester French and his significance not only on this statue but on a national level. Um, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court is going to read the Gettysburg Address as they did back in 1912, and we'll have some other speakers and just um, celebrate this remarkable piece of art in, uh, in Lincoln. And I just wanted to take a moment to say thanks. Um, the Nebraska Humanities Council um, helped provide a grant to help fund the event that we're having, and um, we couldn't have done it without that. The Nebraska State Historical Society provided a, a lot of the images that we saw here on the talk, and we're very grateful to have those um, images preserved so we can understand the history here. Um, and also the Preservation Association of Lincoln sponsoring today's lecture and also the Office of the Capitol Commission for promoting and uh, preserving the monument. And with that, um, that kind of concludes the remarks that I had, so I'll open it up for any questions that you might have. And if not, yes? How tall exactly is the statue of Abraham? Um, the bronze itself is nine feet tall. And I think I saw some newspaper accounts that created it had a weight of about 1,500 pounds at the time it arrived. It's a hollow casting. I'm not sure exactly how thick it is, but fairly heavy. Um, that's a good question, and it, the accounts really aren't clear. Um, the state, I think the state felt that it should be an effort supported by the people, so they, you know, didn't uh, contribute the whole amount. They were willing to contribute a portion, provided that it was matched by funds for private donations. I think it was just, um, it was just a slow process. And, uh, you know, everybody contributed a little bit, and eventually they got there. It just took a lot longer than anybody thought. Yeah, Tom? Did, did you mention the cost of the total um, I didn't, and it's a little bit unclear as to what exactly the final figures were. I think they were estimating it was going to come in right around $35,000 for a total. And the state was, uh, I think, having some trouble coming up with the final amounts. They ended up agreeing to allow French to um, sell small-scale reproductions of the statue in exchange for not having to pay him the full amount of his commission in the end. Yeah. Matt, do you, do you recall um, the Frank Hall campaign uh, that he helped lead with the appointed members uh -huh. uh, was, was a successful campaign? Do you recall mm -hmm. how many previous campaigns kind of had fits and starts with all good intentions but were unsuccessful. I th yeah, one of the newspaper accounts talks about each of the unsuccessful attempts. I think there were like five between about the early 1890s and then the eventual sixth one that was successful. So there were a lot of starts and stops and, and it just took all the stars had to be in alignment for, for this thing to get done, but um, we really accomplished something pretty remarkable to get this this piece of art here in Lincoln. You know, most people are familiar with with the 
Lincoln Memorial in DC, but not everybody realizes that the same team that designed, you know, that very recognizable American monument just a couple years earlier had had done the work here in Lincoln that kind of set the tone for that. Yeah, Eileen. The the Hall collection that you mentioned is on exhibit right now at the Historical Society. It Did is. They have, they have a plaster there? Yeah, I haven't been over to see it myself yet, but they do have um, a, a, one of the early, I think it's a working model in plaster that French did, and then they have a, um, a bronze, which I think is about 37 inches tall. It's a reduced scale copy, but it's uh, one of the, the castings that he did after the full size uh, was completed here. There's also castings of this monument at Lincoln's tomb um, in Springfield, uh, Illinois, and the Chicago Art Institute has one. There's a couple others in um, art co collections. Um, and then there's actually a full-size um, replica in bronze that stands at French's uh, studio at Chesterwood that was um, reproduced from the full-size working model. His daughter had that done in about 1966, I think. The exhibit is at Sheldon, though. Yes. Yeah. Right. <coughs> yes. And is that, is that um, part of the Sheldon collection, that Sheldon. Moquette, or is that yeah. the capital? Is that, I think that's part of the Sheldon collection. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, what was the question? There's a story that goes along with it on the wall, so I think it's... Oh, okay. Right now, it's, I think it's up to only a few more months. Yeah, I'm not sure the full story of how um, Sheldon came to acquire those pieces. I, th I was under the impression that they were both from the Hulk yeah. estate and that, um, that Frank Hall had atta attained those or um, acquired them during his lifetime. You showed the Daniel Chester French um, cemetery monument. Uh -huh. And the one, one of them looks very similar to one that's at Wayuka. Yeah, that it, on the and that's probably not entirely coincidental, um, but only from the fact that I believe that, that the one you're referring to... With the lady with her. Right, it's got a bronze figure. Um, that was also the work of the Kimball brothers, Fred Kimball, who did the granite work here. Um, can't really credit him with the design um, of the monument here at the Capitol, but he certainly executed the work. So when you look at the statue here and the background and all the granite work, um, it does have some characteristics of, of cemetery markers, the way that the carving was done and the, the way the Gettysburg Address is carved into it. So they're, they're definitely connected. Any other questions? Matt, yeah. You did a really beautiful job on pulling uh, so much of this together. I was just curious how long have you been working on it and how much time did a project like this? Um, well, I'm, as with anything, your your research is never never done. You just kind of have to get to a point of putting it together and, and doing it here. But um, the research effort, this actually got started probably about two years ago when we were looking to see if there were any um, sources of replacement granite for the monument to, to fix some areas where we had some damage. Um, and so I started trying to figure out where this granite had come from, which kind of led me into the whole history of the thing. And, and so it's been a little over two years um, in the making here. Are there any other questions? If not, I appreciate very much your time today and hope you learned something about this remarkable piece of uh, art here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Thanks.